property that's here to the Indian River County Hospital District regular monthly meeting. Uh, we will start out tonight with the Reverend Dr. Anna Copeland from the Community Church. Nice to have you here. Thank you. It's, it's a joy. I just want to take a moment to thank you all for your service. I know that public service is sometimes thankless and not always joy-filled. Not everyone is kind or generous or appreciative in this day and age, and so thank you very much for what you do on behalf of this wider county. And uh, I represent a very wide uh, spectrum of theological beliefs, as wide in this county as our diversity politically, uh, but we are all one body. And I grew up in the Midwest. Uh, I'm in one of those corn states and wheat states getting, you know, Indian River um, grapefruit and oranges every year. And I didn't know it was a real place where there were corn <laughs> and So thank you for the privilege of praying with you today. Please pray with me. We thank you, Holy One, for gathering us together this afternoon. We pray for wisdom and discernment for those gathered here in leadership, for their leadership in the county, their, for their faithfulness to the tasks for which you have chosen them. We ask that you would protect them from harm, that you would watch over their families, that in the midst of some circumstances that are challenging and trying, that you would give them peace beyond human understanding and that you would guide their path to discern what is best for all the people that have been entrusted to their care. This afternoon we pray that business might not just be business as usual, but that it might be a true joy with some measure of laughter and discernment and decision for the sake and the good, the common good for all. For all these things and for the preciousness of every day of life and every day we have to live it, we are truly grateful. In your holy name, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. You stand. <clears throat> Can I hear a motion for approval of the special meeting minutes dated May 4th, chairman's meeting minutes dated May 17th, the regular monthly meeting minutes dated May 18th, the special meeting minutes dated May 23rd, and a June disbursement of $898,770.09. Second. Any comment? I'll, I'll approve. Say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, we do have one thing that we're going to add to the agenda tonight, and that is going to be under new business, and that will be um, the approval uh, of the uh, CPA form. But we'll learn about that in our executive director's report, Emory. It's in your packet here. But I, we did need to add that. Um, we have two proclamations tonight, and I will be reading the first proclamation to honor. Andrea Berry, Chief Executive Officer of the Indian River County Healthy Start Coalition. Whereas Andrea has served Indian River County as the Chief Executive Officer for seven years and should be recognized for the growth and success of the Indian River County Healthy Start Coalition. And whereas Andrea has with her knowledge, experience and leadership built trusting community relationships, empowered her team to be the best they can be, supported her board members and sought funding to build and deliver successful programs. And whereas Andrea has implemented the Grow Doula program in Indian River County, which is now being replicated in every Healthy Start coalition in the state of Florida, and helped to bring the Nurse Family Partnership and Babies and Beyond programs to Indian River County. And whereas Andrea has grown the relationship between Healthy Start and the Partners in Women's Health program, was the driving force in working with the local Department of Health to allow Healthy Start to conduct PEPW and implemented the integration of behavioral health services. And whereas Andrea has undertaken the fetal and infant mortality review and grown this initiative to combat infant mortality in Indian River County, reducing the rate from 10 deaths per thousand in 2012 to, port to four per thousand in 2019. 
And whereas Andrea now moves on to fully support her family by continuing to be a wonderful wife to Christopher and a mother to her two boys, Finnegan and Sullivan. Now therefore be it proclaimed by the Board of Trustees of the Indian River County Hospital District that the Board wishes to honor and applaud Andrea Berry for her dedication and sincere compassion in providing services to mothers, fathers, babies, and families of Indian River County through her leadership at the Indian River County Healthy Start Coalition. And be it further proclaimed that the Board of Trustees of the Indian River County Hospital District extend their heartfelt thanks and wishes for success in all of Andrea's future endeavor. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome to say something if you'd like. <laughs> You don't have to. You don't have to. Congratulations. You might have to all yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 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 from May, okay? We're a little late, but it's still worth doing. And that is recognizing National Nurses Week, okay? Um, so next year we'll be on time, I promise. But whereas National Nurses Week is celebrated between May 6th, National Nurses Day, and May 12th, the birthday of the celebrated nurse Florence Nightingale. And whereas nurses are extraordinary individuals who display courage, care, dedication, and commitment to others, serving a critical need in our community. And whereas National Nurses Week honors the contributions and sacrifices of nurses and gives the opportunity to thank them for their service. And whereas the nursing profession is dedicated to meeting the emerging needs of the community by saving lives and improving the outcomes of medical care. And whereas nurses show unwavering dedication to their patients by providing the highest level of individual care and attention by meeting the needs and preserving the dignity of each patient. And whereas nurses maintain a high standard of principles, professionalism, skills, knowledge, and accountability by maintaining and enhancing skills through professional development, research, seminars, and in-service educational opportunities. And whereas in 1982, President Ronald Reagan signed a proclamation establishing National Nurses Week. It is fitting and proper for the Indian River County Hospital District to recognize the dedication and service provided to our community by the nurses who care for us. And whereas the formal week of National Nurses Week has passed, the Indian River County Hospital District recognizes the need to acknowledge our community of local nurses and not allow the opportunity to pass without proper expressions of gratitude. Now therefore be it proclaimed by the Board of Trustees of the Indian River County Hospital District that our community is deeply indebted to our local nurses who so diligently and compassionately provide exceptional medical care to the citizens of Indian River County. Adopted the 23rd May of May, 2023. So here. thank here. you to all of our nurses. Okay, uh, council report, Sebastian. Good afternoon, Sebastian DeMaio filling in for Attorney Jennifer Peschke as counsel for the board. We've received the VNA's notice to exercise its option to purchase the real property described as the hospice house parcel and the lease agreement between the VNA and the district dated November 24th, 2020. And we'll be voting on board resolution 2023-02, which pertains to the sale later this evening. At prior meetings, the trustees discussed the value that a finance and audit committee would provide to the district. Resolution 2023-01 has since been drafted to establish this committee, which will be discussed by the trustees and voted on later this evening. Our budget review of fund and funding cycle is underway, and we have all participated in several budget funding sessions this past month. We remain available to the district staff and to each of the trustees if questions arise throughout this process. 
I have responded to questions from the recruiter that the district has hired to find candidates for the open executive director position and will continue to do so as needs dictate. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Sebastian? If not, we'll move on to the financial report from uh, Michael Kent, treasurer. Uh, fellow trustees, you've received the financial statement and as in the past, we are most fortunate to continue to be in a very healthy fiscal position eight months into this fiscal year. Um, always interests me, but additional tax revenues received in the last month bring our collection against budget to 98%. Also, as in the past, uh, district expenses, um, both for programs and admin, continue to come in under budget. Uh, as I mentioned at last month's meeting, we'll be able to scrutinize all those funded partners and our admin costs uh, for the current year um, as we uh, get into the process of budgeting and making awards for the next fiscal year. Uh, I'm, I'm not a pro at this and clearly there are some we know are going to come in late, but there are others that we've even spoken to some of the agencies as have come to us that we're not clear as to why they haven't done a drawdown. Um, you don't get to wait to the end of the year till we, we do the uh, budgeting work, but we'll make it, it'll be a filter that we can use. Um, as is noted in the uh, written report, uh, our investments total 8.6 million with Deep Blue Investments uh, and an additional 4.5 million with Treasury Direct as of the end of May. And I should note that I received an email from Anne Marie uh, Suriano earlier today noting uh, that we had a T bill uh, which. Uh, matured today uh, and she has asked uh, that those funds which uh, e equal one million two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars to be transferred into our operating account at Seacoast pretty straightforward short and sweet um, today madam chairman all right thank you any questions for Michael okay moving right on then we'll get into the executive director report and Marie Seriano Okay, so your uh, report that I provide in writing is in your packet. Um, so I trust that if there are any questions, I'll take those. But I do want to explain a little bit. Um, as you know, House Bill, um, the House Bill 1130 that was passed last year requires for us to provide um, beginning nine months after the coming fiscal year for a uh, performance review of our district. We've been positioning ourselves and getting ourselves ready for um, that process. And I have, um, again, outlined this in your packet, but with a memo, but I did review with Kate's help. Uh, Kate and Dawn actually did a preliminary conversation and deep dive, I suppose, for firms that do this kind of work. There are not a lot of them around out there, and Florida is new to this process. So um, they did find uh, five different firms, I guess, and we talked with all of those. I have uh, received proposals, and I reviewed all of those proposals and looked at um, the qualifications, the process of work, um, the requirements to the bill so that they will attend to all of those, the team members that would be assigned to um, this project. So I have chosen um, BJM, which is, uh, I have the full proposal if anybody wants to see that. But we do have Dave Slovin and Bruce Curran, who are um, two of the partners here in our audience tonight. If you have any questions for that when we get to that item, as Mary Beth has um, indicated, would be uh, recommended and approved later on in the meeting. So I do have all of, those, all of that. If there are questions, I guess we'll do them at that time when we do the... Actually, I, I think if there's questions to them, it would be pertinent to do that right now because um, it, otherwise <laughs> you're <laughs> sitting and okay. waiting. Yes, so, so, so. I, again, I provided the review and the summary of all of the organizations that we talked to and looked at um, and the, have the specifics on this group for you in the packet. 
I guess I have a question for them. How's that? <laughs> okay. Um, I would like to know who you have worked with on doing something like this. It's a fairly new process, as I understand it, and I think there's still some um, details to be built around it from the government, but can you just tell us what kind of background you have to be able to do that? This is a very important and a very serious thing for the for us to go through, right? Um, and this because this is our performance and what we're doing. So I want to be understand what qualifications you really do have to do this. Sure. Well, uh, first I'll talk about BGM Group and our audit division, BGM CPA, as well as our partner, uh, the Surgicalist Group, and then uh, give you an idea of some of our experience doing these special district performance reviews. Um, BJM Group is actually a network of accounting firms in Georgia and Florida. We're about 100 employees. We have a dedicated audit division, and I'm sorry, I'm using the term audit. This is not an audit, but we have a de dedicated audit division. The uh, two auditors that will be working with us on, on this particular engagement have 40 plus, actually it's a lot more than that, but I won't give away their ages, uh, 40 plus years of experience working with uh, local governments, special districts, and those types of organizations. Um, we partnered with the Surgicalist Group, and I, I think this is really what sets us apart from uh, other entities that have done these performance reviews or are considering doing it, in that we have, we have the financial expertise to conduct the performance review evaluations and the sur surgicalist group, Bruce and his team have the healthcare operations expertise. So working hand in hand, it's you st you're still contracting with one entity, the buck stops here, um, but together we uh, can add, we can make sure that your the final report that's delivered has recommendations that you can actually use. And, and that is a, a something I wanted to point out, this isn't a pass-fail type of thing. It's the idea is draw in information, analyze it, compare it with other districts in Florida and other similar entities across the country, and then come back with recommendations, work with you to finalize the report, and then as we can file it with the state or, or you guys can. Um, our experience, and I'll end this pretty quickly. Our experience is we've uh, just completed our 27th uh, performance review for uh, uh, fire districts in the state of Florida. We've contracted with 30 of them. We're done with 27. The three that are left are uh, Fort Myers area that got the extension through year end. So I actually literally just drove here from the uh, FASD conference, Florida Association <laughs> of Special Districts in Orlando, and uh, the feedback has been universally positive. Recommendations have been well received. It's been a great partnership for every performance review, and um, we'll take that experience. So I, I do think we have a good approach that we've honed over 27 performance reviews that we can apply here and where we had a partner who had uh, EMS operational expertise for those, uh, Jim Angle, who mm -hmm. Marie knows, and uh, Jay Angle Group, the Surgicalist Group will bring that healthcare operational expertise to, to play here. Okay. Anne Marie noted your Florida based, well, you said Florida and Georgia, but where's, where's, the, where's home? Uh, well, for me, Georgia, but the, the office that will be conducting the performance review is in Tampa and as well as Surgicalist Group is also headquartered in Tampa. And can you tell us exactly, because I'm new at this, where, who, who asked for this report and who does it go back to? And if there are concerns, uh, do you bring those forward or does someone else, like an audit? The, well, it's the, the state that mandated the performance review. So ultimately, this needs to be filed uh, by July 1 of next year, back with three specific state contacts. Um, I know from experience with the fire district performance reviews, what's the best way to say this? It's more of a, the, the value is to the fire district. The state has been 
making sure that all of them are received, but I haven't heard any other feedback. As far as the, the recommendations in the performance review, uh, this is your performance review. It's not ours to file, so we're not done until we agree on the, on the recommendations and the next steps. That's when we compile the final report. We can come back and, and uh, an be available to answer questions here, and then ultimately when you're completely satisfied, it gets either you can file it with the state or we will. I think as just some background, um, there's been some concerns about some special districts in the state um, and maybe, um, I don't want to say misuse of funds, but, but maybe not being as careful of how the funds are used in, in that perspective. And I believe that that's why the legislature said that every special district must go through these performance reviews. If I were to see your checklist or strategy for approaching us, what would, what would it look like? I have that in the full proposal that I can oh, okay. show you. We outlined thumbnail, our thumbnail, just, I haven't seen it, just thumbnail sketch. I don't, you don't, <laughs> if, it, if, it was, if, it's, if it's more than uh, can be crammed into a thumbnail sketch, forget about it and I'll read it. I haven't seen it yet. It's a, at the highest level, it's a evaluation of your programs, activities, functions, and investments. And the state has mandated, it's a, actually it's an eight step process with the ninth step being recommendations. So we look at, um, we look at each of these activities from a financial perspective as well as an operational perspective. Again, that makes this a little different than uh, engagements you may have done before. And then we'll come back with recommendations for changes, improvements, uh, efficiencies. Again, we all discuss because there are, it's possible that uh, rec we're just looking at the data differently than you are, so there might be uh, differences of opinion. We make sure that the final report we agree on, and then it gets filed. Does that that? Yeah, I'll, I'll read it. Based on, on your discussions with Anne Marie and what you've gleaned about this district, are there any things that are unique or worrisome to you um, in contrast to fire districts or many of the other kinds of special districts you've been working with? Offhand, no. The, uh, re when I, I, I first stood in front of the, the commissioners at West Manatee Fire District for our first ever performance review, <laughs> if they had asked the same question, <laughs> I probably would have uh, said, well, this is kind of first ever. That, and we were the first to, to, they were the first district, we were the, the first to start doing a performance review, but if you hone the process, the, you know, I'll say in advance, there's, there will be work from your team up front because we'll ask for a lot of data, but again, our, even the discovery process is well documented, well organized. Once we get the data, we can do our analysis without having to burden the, your, your team. We're all unique, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> Very much so. Yes. And if they're not, we think we are. Yeah. <laughs> no, you, everyone it has been so far that, we, that we've worked with. I'm sure, I'm sure. Will there be opportunity for the individual trustees to participate? Are we gonna be getting inquiries, uh, contact? I don't usually. I don't think so. I'm, I'm going, just kind of going through the discovery list. We can, if you'd like to be involved in the, yeah. the process, we can. Time for that if everybody has, anything, that. And if anybody has it, anything to add to the findings or the things that they're looking at. And, and we can I do certainly that. recommend at the draft report level, normally each district will take about a week to go through it, organize We'll all their, see that before it's finalized. Then we have a discussion and start working through the, the details. And that takes, on average, Four, weeks, four to six, six weeks for the whole months for the, the process. Whole process is uh, five months. I the think. shortest five has been twelve months. weeks. Okay. Realistically, twenty weeks. Okay. Okay. And it'll be. It's because of the discovery process. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're pretty efficient, but it's there. We're going to be asking for some things that may be a little more difficult. To now looking to be an officious intermeddler, I'm happy to, I may send you a memo or something. I don't need to necessarily have contact, but just curious about how you were going to approach us. Thanks. 
may want to consider sitting in on the kickoff call as well. That's a good time when we're introducing the team and generally talking about the approach. Any other questions? Thank you for being here. Thank you. Yeah, that, Thank you that helped a lot. Uh, okay. Can I say one more thing? <laughs> so also on um, Monday we had the main CSAC meeting and they w we were asked to um, the grants review committee went over what Bob Schlitt heads that committee and um, they spent three days in total all day every day Michael Kent sits on that um, <laughs> right here hearing from the proposers but they had two million five hundred and sixty seven thousand seven hundred and sixty six seven hundred and seventy six um, dollars available that was approved by the County Commission to spend but they had requests of three million seven hundred and sixty six nine ninety three those requests were from 35 organizations 11 of which had more than one program for a total of 56 programs so similar to us obviously larger than us but similar to us so there were 25 of those uh, programs that received the full funding request there were 10 that received no funding from CSAC um, some of those are organizations and one of those that I can recall is an organization that we fund as well and that is a program that was asked of them not of us and so that was one that did not make the cut this year. Um, the remaining 21 received funding in an amount less than what they requested. So there are a lot of good programs out there, I think, that are, there's not enough money to provide, I guess, for in our county that, that are doing good things, but I, um, I'm not sure how some of them will, uh, carry on with those programs but in addition this year they the grants committee added to the recommendation and we did approve that recommendation to go to the county commission on Tuesday that if any of the funds were not used through the year like we have that we award but the organization for whatever reason doesn't um, complete their their program goes away or for whatever reason doesn't accept the money or doesn't need the money then um, those those dollars would go back into some of the organizations that they were unable to fund or that didn't make the cut there were two specifically um, so I I continue to believe that there are some ways that we can align and the efficiencies that we have that we can manage some of those programs um, I talked to Dylan shortly today so we talked about I can't talk because it's sunshine law so I can't talk to the other members of the CSAC committee about those things but um, we did talk a little bit about some ideas before and conversations that I might have to spark that there's roughly 400 a little over four hundred thousand dollars in funding that would could be available to them if we were to adopt some of those programs or and they're actually the same programs that we already fund same organization same program so the money the tax dollar is just split between the county commission and between us so it seems a little inefficient so anyway that's still a work in progress but that vote will take place to approve that funding hopefully approve that funding um, at the Tuesday County Commission meeting so I will attend that as well that's it okay um, we'll get into the funded agencies reports I'm just going to remind everybody you have 10 to 15 minutes mm -hmm. not 20 to 30 okay and we have a lot of it and Karen told me that if you go longer she will vote no on anything <laughs> you want so I'm just telling you that right up front okay so we're gonna start with child care resources and in all seriousness remember there are four questions that we ask you to come we are going to be brief um, hi everybody I'm Shannon McGuire Bowman I'm the executive director of child care resources I just want to say thank you so much for our partnership um, you help us provide amazing health care 
to our children and families. We're grateful for your partnership. Um, Tracy Griffiths, our Director of Wellness and Early Intervention is here, and Tara Beard, our School Director is here as well um, to give you a quick update and then answer any questions you may have. Turn over to Tracy. Hello, everyone. Um, I think in those four questions, I can kind of give you a summary of our new programming that um, you most recently funded, and that is our mental health piece, um, which every time we add something, I think, I'm not sure how we did without that. So um, it becomes my new favorite, and this, it, it really is kind of amazing um, when you sit down and think about what has been able to be done. Um, in February, we hired um, our first early childhood mental health therapist. Um, she has a background in infant toddler mental health with um, a lot of history with trauma. Um, when we sat down and looked at all the areas that she's currently addressing, um, homelessness, active DCF cases, children that are separated from parents, um, inconsistent involvement of parents, um, aggressive behaviors that kids are exhibiting, witnessing um, domestic violence, um, situations and family issues, divorce, custody issues, um, therefore leading to emotional dysregulation um, and those kinds of things, parent incarceration and attachment issues. So when we looked at that, we're, you know, it's kind of amazing that you think about these small children dealing with such heavy things. Um, so looking at, again, she started in February and she already has a caseload of 21 children. Um, she's put in about 176 hours on one-to-one -one play therapy with them. Um, 78 hours of classroom observations and about 65 hours dealing with parents and, and helping them um, dealing with these issues too in conjunction together. Um, also um, collaborating with our um, case manager on home visiting, which I think is gonna get to be a bigger and bigger part of that program um, in intervening and helping. Um, next month, um, we will have our early childhood mental health and behavioral coach starting, and we are very excited about that. Um, she comes to us, um, has a degree, a master's degree in exceptional student education and applied behavioral analysis. Um, she currently works um, with many children dealing with autism and other behavioral disorders and um, really looks at the individualized um, intervention piece and parent training in, in that. So I think that's gonna be such a great addition for our families because it's really a piece that we've lacked. It's something that parents ask for and desire and that is that intervention and collaboration between home and school. Um, we will be putting a really large focus on emotional regulation and helping those children who are dealing with such heavy issues and um, helping um, put into place some appropriate strategies in the classroom and really helping the teachers um, deal with those things and, and really help those kids on all, all fronts. So those two positions will work hand in hand together um, and really cover a lot of bases um, together in, in helping not only the children, but families, teachers, so it's gonna be really a widespread um, impact that they are able to have. Um, one of our first trainings that we are, we are going to do, um, she is going to focus heavily on parent engagement and bringing parents um, up to speed on a lot of things, and one of those first things is gonna be, what is trauma? What does trauma look like? Um, because it's not always what people think it is, and, and it can be those hidden things that you don't really realize what that impact is. Um, and so she's going to be um, helping our parents really start to understand that, doing um, the same thing with our teachers so that our teachers and parents are hearing the same thing. And again, we can do that collaborative approach. So it really, um, you know, those are the challenges we face. Those are the successes we're already seeing um, in all of those things. So we just, um, again, are so appreciative because it's been such a missing piece for us. I'm up. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that the hospital district generously funded was um, some professional development training for our teachers through the Florida Association of Infant Mental Health. Um, the teachers, all the teachers within the school, including any support staff that work directly with children, are working towards getting their endorsement in infant mental health and trauma, making sure they understand what it looks like in that birth to five realm when children are having mental health issues. Uh, it took us a little while to get there. There were some challenges within the organization due to COVID. 
but I'm proud to say we are beginning this process well on our way and we will be the first school in the state of Florida through um, FAIMH that will have their entire staff certified with this endorsement. So thank you so much. I really appreciate the bullet points yeah. on the second page, the successes, <laughs> challenges, the collaboration of the programs offered, the four questions that we asked you to cover. So yeah. thank you very, thank very you. much for that. 21 kids out of 160, and has she seen them all? Uh, the point of my question is, what percentage do you think? You've got 150 or 60 students. Yeah. How many of these babies are needing some kind of assistance? It's crazy. I mean, it's, I, a conservative estimate is 20 to 30 percent, mm -hmm. I would say. Yeah. But in the last two weeks, I mean, I feel like I say this every time, so I apologize. But in the last two weeks, we just had a mom voluntarily put her children into foster care and leave. Um, but she let them remain at the school. It, it's increasing constantly, <laughs> sadly. I guess I knew the answer. We have heard it before, but it's it just frightens us every time we do hear it. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean like I was. No, it, no, it it's just the real world. Astounding, honestly, mm -hmm. uh, the level of trauma. Yeah, we have our highest number of open DCF cases we've ever had in the history of our institution. Really? Mm -hmm. In your research, in questioning, um, is there is there reasons why it's going that direction? Have you determined any? patterns at all or is it just I don't know if it's a direct correlation from fallout with COVID <laughs> we've been <laughs> hearing that oh, and that's why that. I asked the question but um, it's definitely housing people are losing their housing they're losing their jobs they're just frustrated domestic violence so that's what we're seeing a tremendous amount of is domestic violence and incarceration divorces yeah. it's a lot of those situations just not they're just in, so difficult to turn around. You know, these homeless families, the housing, the, all of it, it's just, you know, there are so many challenges. It's, you know, we, we wrap them up in so much support, but it's, you know, we take several steps forward and then we're back down. And, and it's, you know, it, it's small victories that we see and the kids are, you know, um, getting that consistent care. So, you know, that matters so much, but it is, it's a challenge. Do you sure. refer the adults for, mental health care too <coughs> do they take you up on it or do yes. they thought do they yes they do um we do um have funding for families to um, get mental health services and they do they it is part of what um we discuss with them when we do our initial assessment when they enroll in the program and remind them annually when they do re-enrollment that that is something that we offer and that they should not hesitate to ask um and and they do they do and and our teachers are excellent about knowing what's going on and seeing a change in a child or a change in a parent and, and being proactive and kind of alerting us to do kind of a change. And where do you that. refer them to? I mean, it's Mental Health Association? MHA. Okay, MHA. That's good. I think we have two adults who are at New Horizons mm -hmm. for medication management. Yes. Okay, New Horizons too. Other questions? You guys um, do a phenomenal job here and uh, just continue to do that for our kids. Thank, Thank you very you. much. And you did great on your timing. Yeah, appreciate that. <laughs> okay, Treasure Coast, Community Health, Vicki. Vicki, you have one minute left because you started way at the back. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, I brought my phone, so I've got my own little timer there. Just let me get started. Start. So when the radar goes beep, 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 we'll know I'm done. Um, so thank you very much for having me today. Um, in light of having a cold, I may be done in less than 10 minutes, um, but I brought my bottle of water just in case I choke up, literally. Um, I want to thank you all again for your total support. Um, this past year has been challenging for us insofar as we come to the district for reimbursements for, to help us with a lot of the indigent care. And because the COVID pandemic timeframes kept extending, so did the Medicaid enrollments. And so we were under budget in each of our 
um, service areas and I didn't hear a ripple saying why aren't you spending more money um, so again this year we know is going to be different because of the disenrollment uh, many many Medicaid patients are off the rosters and we we are working with them to try to either get them re-enrolled with that or marketplace insurance certainly on our sliding fee scale and um, so we'll just have to see how this sorts out over the next six months. It's a best guess that we submit for our um, next year's funding. But we Vicky, do appreciate your support. Can I ask you, what's your, your shortfall support? with the Medicaid, though, versus your costs? Um, actually, we get pretty close on Medicaid because okay. the federally qualified health centers do get wraparound. Okay. The, the problem for us is that the majority of our patients are adults. And unless you have children in your household, you're not going to qualify for Medicaid. So we have a lot of working men, for example, that come to us for care, and they don't qualify for Medicaid even though they are within the income constraints. Okay. Um, and that extends then into things like food and housing as well. Um, so oftentimes still it's a question of do I get the medical care or do I take care of my basics? So um, that continues to be the theme song around the county since the latest Alice report came out. Yeah. Um, I do want to say that um, our overall growth at Treasure Coast was about um, between 3 and 5 percent depending on what we actually um, service line were examining. Um, although the exception to that was at the Gifford Health Center where we saw an almost 20 percent increase in the number of people that use that facility. So again, I thank you very much for your strong support there. Um, part of that is because I believe we moved our pediatrics to a separate wing and we added optometry for our children and so I think that that helped a lot. Um, we have a new provider that's going in there um, and so I, a, a male <laughs> for a change and so I continue to see that success there. Um, the number of encounters that we took care of or visits were over 100,000 again this year. And so I'd like to say that um, everybody knows about us and I'm grateful for their support um, and confidence in the high quality care that we give. But the reality is that although we touch one in six lives in this community, we hear every day about people, particularly now with so many physicians having gone to concierge, about I need a physician, I need a dentist, I need this, I need that. And so we continue to recruit and orient um, new providers. Uh, unfortunately, we're in sort of a catch-22 because as cycles go, um, we need space for them. Um, we have divvied and refurbished uh, closets and um, sent things off to storage and people working at home, but the reality is we are um, going back to a growth phase. And so um, that is both a blessing and a challenge. Um, did I cover two points in that? Okay, um, <laughs> so um, we certainly are going to be working on that. But I did want to highlight um, that there is some great things that will be happening both for Treasure Coast Community Health and most especially for the community in general. We will be doing an expansion at our Oslo campus. Um, so that will allow us uh, much more square footage and we will have a dedicated pediatric center there and that will move the children from our existing Oslo into that building and then make more room for adults in our current building. And you say, well, that's probably no big deal, but particularly in dental services it is because in most federally qualified health centers they see the children the most in dental services. Um, Medicaid pays for most of them and the children need it, so it's a win-win all the way around. In our situation, um, and again, a blessing and a curse, um, more adults call in for appointments, and so our children, as a percentage, are probably 20 to 30 percent instead of 80 percent. And so by putting them in a separate building with a separate scheduler, I'm really looking forward to the fact that we'll be able to take care of more children there. So our blueprints have put in additional chairs, like seven additional chairs five for children and um, for routine work, and two for what we call a transitional basis, where the children might be only two or three years old, they come over and they sit in the big boy or girl chairs. We really aren't doing anything besides getting them used to having fingers in their mouth and open wide and you know getting that warm and fuzzy about dentists in general. Um, and that's easier these days than it was 
30 years ago when I was going and they were pulling out that needle, boy, if that didn't scare you, nothing would. Our dentists have really um, honed their skill sets. So that's very exciting. Unfortunately, it's probably a year away. Um, but I do want to say that we're not sitting around idly. Um, the jail um, just passed its first year of services from Treasure Coast Community Health, and that seems to be um, accolades all the way around, uh, particularly to the staff that we have put there. Um, they get along well. They've helped change the culture um, of the sheriff's office. Um, more understanding on both sides of what it's like to be there. Um, and we have great plans there to increase chronic care for those individuals. We do some of that now, but we're going to do it in a much more dedicated um, and uh, data-driven way. And then, um, in addition, we're working um, to ensure that everyone who comes in and needs assistance with medication-assisted therapy, I still have three minutes, um, <laughs> will still get that um, support. And that uses a lot of psychiatric time, which is very expensive, and so everyone kind of wants that just to wait until they get discharged. But that's not a good way to start back in society after you've had your, um, your day in court. So we're really working to increase those number of hours um, to provide that. We've got about eight individuals in the queue right now. Some of them have gotten their physical, some have already gotten their first shot, a couple of them are waiting. Um, and we see that program building through the support of the Substance Awareness Center and Right Life. Um, and so we will be doing more work with discharge planning and helping them um, be able to get their prescriptions and anything they need. Um, even though we give them prescriptions on the way out the door, it's a very limited quantity, of course and their new life can be confusing um, and chaotic for the first week and suddenly they're out of medicine. So we're streamlining that path to keep them um, on track and successful. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is because I am the chair of the Senior Collaborative, you're going to be hearing more about something called Upslide, which is a program, Karen's shaking her head, a program to help so many of the people in town who have for various reasons become more isolated and we know that so we're a social being and our good health relies on being able to relate um, on a regular basis with other people and upslide will be a mechanism for that. Um, so that's a, that's a whole different story but um, we're making great strides in this community with healthcare in general and it's in large measure to the support that you give all of our agencies so thank you. you um you personally, to me, are amazing because... Because <laughs> I'm here with a cold? <laughs> no, but you're, you're on every board and everywhere I go, you are there. And it's just it's well, the, the amazing need is and so you're great. involved and, in everything. And I, so. and I have so much confidence in the people that we collaborate with that it's hard to stay at home and just say it's somebody else's problem. So thank you. <laughs> well, please continue to let us know where we can help. Okay? I will. Because the need is growing and it's great and... Um, Treasure Coast does a great job at doing it. Thank you. Michael, you had a question. Well, you noted you're up 5% overall, mm -hmm. 20 in Gifford, but I also saw um, pharmacy medications, 24% bump. Yeah. Um, Again, a blessing and a curse. We receive medication from the 340B uh, portion of the federal right. government, which allows us to give those discounts. But because we are not open seven days a week, we wanted to expand that ability by creating partnerships with outside pharmacies like Walgreens and CVS and Walmarts and all those other folks. And that worked very well for someone who got a prescription out of the emergency room on a Friday night. Unfortunately, because of the popularity of the 340B program, now there's this closure and they're saying we're not going to give those people discounts if they go to Walmart, even if they're your patients. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're trying to get people to understand that we want to do the very best for them and they need to come back to one of our three pharmacies whenever possible. So that we basically heard that same thing from whole family. Right. Yeah, um, you're going to hear from right. Marie again. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I'm done with my 10 minutes. I hope that covers all the four yeah, questions. questions. Paul had a question. Yeah, uh, ge geographically, um, where are you seeing, and Oslo obviously seems to be an obvious answer right now because you're expanding, um, next three to five years, if, if you had a wish list in terms of expansion, um, 
uh, uh, increased accessibility? What sort of accessibility issues are you currently experiencing for well, patients? I was going to I wasn't going to say anything, um, but you must have read my crystal ball. <laughs> um, we have not been west at all. Um, past about 43rd, unless you count Felsmere, which is pretty far north. And we know that there's a number of senior facilities there, not all assisted living, a lot of mobile, par mm -hmm. ma whatever the proper name is, senior complexes. Um, and they have to drive back into town um, unless they stop at Point West. And that's a wonderful facility, but it does tack on an urgent care facility cost as well. So we actually um, are working on that west side location now. Um, to to round that out. Well, just not not speaking. Yeah, the rumor is true. We, we're <laughs> buying the Clifton Furniture Building. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> I was going to let you be coy. Yeah, so much. For, well, you know, it's a small town. I knew it couldn't stay secret. Um, and I appreciate the expansion of the South County because that's something I do. I've heard is just the, the accessibility for the south end of the county being. Um, sometimes not by you necessarily but just generally um South it could be North better County both have a tendency to be forgotten you yeah. know we're yeah. very we're very centric to vero beach proper the downtown area or the ocean front downtown whichever way you look at it and those two areas sometimes can be slighted but west side definitely has been and with all the growth out there um it just seemed proper for us to try to and there's help. going to be more oh, growth whole interchange. Yeah, right. I mean, that's exactly. Big, and, you know, it would be nice to keep traffic local instead of everybody trucking back, right. you know, and clogging our streets down here. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Thanks, Vicky. Paul. Thank Thanks, you, Barbara. <laughs> I don't have to worry about a press release now. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you, Vicki, I thought you was kind of sweet mom. I didn't have any indication. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you feel better, Vicki. Take care. Okay, next we've got the uh, VNA, Lundy, or Pat, <laughs> or both. Good afternoon, trustees. Um, I'm Pat Nipper with the Visiting Nurse Association, and thank you for very much for having us here today and for supporting us over the past year. We've been really grateful uh, for your, not only for the funding that you provide for our f programs, but for your partnership with us and always being able to have open dialogue and communication. So to ensure we meet the 10 minutes, Karen, I'm going to do less talking. So I'm going to turn it over to Lundy, <laughs> and he will talk about uh, <laughs> challenges and all right, I'm going to start my Apple Watch on three minutes <laughs> so I can finish my part in three minutes. Okay, so I have three trends uh, for you. Yes, we're going to keep it on time. Uh, three trends for you to talk about. Obviously, some of these are very well known. Staffing continues to be a big thing. So how it's obviously impacting everybody in healthcare, especially RNs. So RNs is the, is the, the part that is really difficult. So we have increased how it's impacted the VNA. We've had to increase our sign-on bonuses. We're up to $15,000 for a sign-on bonus now. And we've had to increase our compensation as well for RN. So we're all competing for a lot of the same people. But what we've seen is travelers have decided that quality of life is better than quantity of money. And so some of them are actually coming home and staying put. So that's been really good. That leads me to my second trend, which is healthcare is a tough business. <laughs> Um, because of the first part of the part of it's because of the first trend, but it's really hard financially to make it in healthcare. We all know that hospitals are losing money. According to Fierce Healthcare, half of the healthcare systems lost money in 2022, and uh, they are facing even greater challenges this year as hospital utilization goes down. That impacts the VNA because as hospital utilization, utilization goes down, that impacts the home health referrals. So it's all we're all sort of tied in this together. But um, one thing that is helpful is that hospitals are um, realizing that people want more options, so they're offering hospital at home. So we all know that the Cleveland Clinic launched uh, their care at home program. 280 hospitals across the U.S., according to CMS, have already launched hospital at home. Mount Sinai was the first one in 2015, and they have shown demonstrated outcomes of reduced readmission rate and shorter hospital stay. So we think that's an opportunity. So the VNA obviously would like to be part of that. So that's part of what we see our uh, potential growth area. We have nothing to announce or anything on that, but we see the opportunity there. And then um, the, the final one is technology. So we're all hearing a, 
everybody's hearing craziness about AI and hopefully you've got all the right stocks that are going crazy right now. But um, so we are bringing AI into the VNA. Um, you know, this latest announcement this week, you probably saw it with Google and Mayo Clinic. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be like, um, Alexa, I just saw Mary Jones. Please look at her chart and review all the other, her diagnosis and tell me what we should do. And Alexa is going to sit there and tell, like, provide the treatment plan, the prescriptions or whatever. I mean, it's going to be craziness. So we're going to be seeing this coming into our market. I'm sure Cleveland Clinic is going to be connected with all of these um, uh, technologies. And so but that's another trend that we see happening. And, and Kathy Orton will tell you a little bit about how the VNA is using AI to help improve the care to the residents of this county. And my three minutes is up. So Kathy Orton is our Chief Patient Experience Officer and Chief Regulatory and Compliance Officer. She's going to talk to you for a moment. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for your support. In my role at uh, VNA, uh, I also do oversee our hospice program, so I wanted to report on that today. Um, VNA has had successes and challenges this year, just like all other organizations. Are Kathy, can I ask you to get closer to the speaker because you have a soft voice and, and no, people always, need to hear you. Our biggest challenge over the last year and a half has really been uh, our certificate of need challenge. As you know, VNA Hospice has been the sole provider of hospice care since we were initially licensed in 1986. Um, and through that time, through the certificate of need process, we've demonstrated to the Agency of Healthcare that we've been meeting the needs of this community and the residents. Um, despite that uh, documented need in 12-21, ACA awarded a preliminary license to another hospice provider. Uh, since that time, we've been challenging uh, that decision. We did appeal it, and in September of 22, um, at a seven-day or six-day uh, trial in front of administrative law judge where community supporters, uh, staff, and expert witnesses highlighted our program, the decision for another hospice to come in this county was overturned by the judge. Unfortunately, in big news, that you can overturn that, uh, uh, the, the, uh, eight, the hospice appealed, and now that decision is waiting for ACA to make the final decision. So the judge's ruling is under review. Surprising. Um, so hospice, hospice care this year, we've admitted year to date uh, over 1,100 patients into our program. Hospice provides care in all locations. So uh, not only in the home, in our hospice house, but skilled nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, and both hospitals in the county. So collaborating with those providers ensures that patients that don't, aren't in your typical home setting get the care that they need for hospice services. One of our other big challenges at the VNA, like many hospices, is our length of stay. Um, hospice is most beneficial when patients are referred early, and d d data demonstrates improved quality of life for both the patient and the caregiver. Our average length of stay at VNA is 59 days, which has increased over the last year by 13 percent, but the average uh, length of stay nationally is 65. And as you may know, the hospice benefit was meant to be uh, six months, so we're, we have room to grow there. One of our big initiatives to make that happen is our advanced care planning initiative. We've had a community-wide initiative to educate consumers and providers about the value of making decisions early on and documenting and making everyone know their wishes at end of life or when they're facing a serious illness. Uh, we do have an advanced care planner, a licensed clinical social worker that works within our hospice as well as our home health division, making uh, visits to our patients and <coughs> community partners to educate uh, consumers to make sure their goals align with the goals of their health care. It's not necessarily a hospice referral, but that information given early will probably uh, lead to earlier admissions to hospice. As Lundy referenced, um, we are using uh, technology to help identify patients within our home care program that would benefit from benefit from advanced care planning visits. So this technology, although maybe not artificial intelligence, is predictive uh, analytic software. And it identifies patients in our home care um, that could benefit from timely admission to hospice in the conversation. So we have seen some success with that. 
Um, other initiatives for us has been um, really, as my role as patient experience officer, I am committed to our outcomes, and as you see, our outcomes have been above the national and state average. So one of our commitments is to infuse the voice of the patient, the caregiver, into our care delivery and redesign it based on input. So through one-on-one -on -one interviews with patients and caregivers, uh, volunteer calls, weekly calls, and tuck-in calls, we're getting more, more data back so we can redesign that care. So I want to thank you all for everything, and I'm here to answer any questions. Well, thank you very thank you, much. Thank you. Interesting. So we just wanted to take a moment to introduce you to our new Vice President of uh, Home Health and Private Care, uh, Jackie Kevel. Jackie, you want to come up? <laughs> um, Ed Lowe left us uh, early in the year, and um, Jackie's been with the VNA for over 15 years in a number of different roles and capacities, and extremely knowledgeable about the VNA, so I'll let her talk about herself, but this is her first time here, and we know that we're on our 10-minute clock, so we'll just be a minute. <laughs> I know, and I'm going to be a little bit brief, so thank you all so very much. Uh, as Pat said, I'm Jackie, and I actually um, transitioned into this role in March, um, so the last couple of months have really been spent just evaluating where we are, looking at our programs and um, our teams and really looking for efficiencies in how we deliver care and also uh, to be good stewards of all the resources we have. And so our big focus and our big initiative uh, within home health, traditionally home health has always been very task oriented and so we really wanna focus on that whole patient uh, care and so our real push is to not just do that task when we go into the home but also to really uh, focus on the whole patient and collaborating with the team, whether it's for spiritual care, social work, um, you know, whatever disciplines internally, but also externally uh, to provide the care that that patient uh, may need and that family. Um, we do that by utilizing um, our nurse practitioner as well, and as Kathy talked about, our advanced care planning team, but also hospital prevention uh, program in our um, Nurse practitioner works very closely with the patient's primary care physicians in the community to make medication changes or to do whatever um, changes need to be made to that plan of care to keep that patient from having to go to the ER or preventing a hospitalization. And um, I think that's reflected in our um, patient satisfaction because overall we've had a very high uh, patient satisfaction rate and our most recent CMS data has us at five stars for patient satisfaction. So we're very proud of that. Uh, Lundy alluded to our challenges. Um, staffing again has been our biggest challenge, which has affected our volume. Um, historically, about the same time last year, we're about 100 to 125 patients. Um, below census where we were probably a year ago. But since the public health emergency ended and uh, those travel assignments are going away, we finally started to get some really good um, RN candidates and we've been um, interviewing and making offers and I'm happy to say that a lot of those offers are being accepted. So uh, we'll be training some new nurses over this summer we have also identified um, LPNs that were within our teams that were IV certified, but we weren't utilizing them um, to uh, work with patients that have IV. So we've comp comped them, and now they are freeing up some of our nurses on those nursing visits. And we've also have a couple of LPNs that are going through the IV certification program. And over the next couple of months, they will be um, certified to do IVs, so we're really happy with that as well. Um, the other challenge is our payer mix, and um, we know Medicare Advantage plans are really outpacing our traditional Medicare, and nationwide uh, Medicare Advantage plans are about 50% of Medicare eligible uh, participants. And in Indian River County, we are about a 60% um, traditional Medicare and 40% uh, Medicare Advantage. And every year that goes up by about 
you know, two to three percent. So we're watching that very closely. There's a lot of home care agencies um, had challenged and, and looking for that Medicare, traditional Medicare patients. So uh, for us, traditional Medicare is so important for us to be able to continue to do um, and participate in a lot of the programs and a lot of the offerings that we have at the VMA. Um, in our clinical scorecard and our quality <coughs> measures, um, we have consistently, um, we are three, uh, out of three of the five measures, we've consistently scored better than state and national. And um, in our rehospitalizations, which is a, a big um, topic for everybody. We all want to keep our patients out of the hospital, and of course the hospital doesn't want their patients bouncing back. So we are at 12.4 percent for 60-day rehospitalizations compared to about 15 percent state and 15 percent national. But we've consistently been below state and national for a rehospitalization. So we're just really proud of that, and we work to keep those patients out of the hospital and in their home. And I think that's it. <laughs> Brief. Um, anybody have questions? I just, I just, um, you all are have always been a value member of our medical community, and and I appreciated your comments. The the phrase whole patient, looking at the whole patient, the caregivers, and I want you. You know, I'm going to get on a soapbox. Um, when I hear AI, the way that Lundy described it, is scary, and and I think our culture. Um, more and more is viewing uh, or forgetting that the practice of medicine is an art form and it has tools and science and technology are tools as are empathy, sympathy, emotional IQ, creativity, innovation, curiosity, um, but caregiving primary. And my concern is hearing what Lundy had to say is the pressures that are coming to bear that we have to have the bestest, bestest, brightest, you know, whatever, um, because it's the new shiny thing to do. And, um, you know, Siri doesn't have a pair of eyes, lips, nose, and no heart. And Siri, what's wrong with my patient? Uh, how should I treat them? Uh, you know, I can, I can understand it being helpful in a diagnostic and having a collective understanding of the diagnostic workup, but the treatment plan is, is I think, f for the heart and creativity of the caregiver. And, and so I would just implore you as you guys get these kinds of pressures that, that you remember what your core values are, which I, I, I heard loud and clear from you, and I appreciate them. Yeah. Thank you. And I appreciate that. I think there's a place for AI, and certainly in our situation, we're using it to help to identify those patients who predicted maybe, um, you know, mortality within 90 days to six months. And so to start those conversations early, because most of those patients want to be in their home, and they don't want to be back and forth to the hospital. And traditionally, as I talked about, task-oriented, so, you know, you had an order for a nurse, and the nurse went in and did the task. Uh, we're really uh, integrating more social work, more home health aid, and other disciplines into that team because there are social issues, there are, you know, uh, family dynamics. Maybe they don't have any food in the home or they don't have the money to be able to buy their prescriptions and they just got discharged. And we know that the number one reason patients bounce back to the hospital is they didn't pick up their medications. Mm -hmm. So really focusing on all of that. While the AI is going to be important, I think, we really want to focus on that whole patient and the whole family. And so we're really um, moving to that model and have been doing it for several months. But that is going to be a primary focus of mine as I move more into this role and, and wrap, oops, I'm sorry, and wrap my head around um, you know, our agency and, and everything we're doing, but where we want to go in the future. So, thank you. Thank you, Jackie. So, one minute. Um, Liz and I will wrap up with the mobile clinic, uh, but we also wanted to just mention we're so grateful for your funding for the community music therapy program, which launched this past year, and we've had some really good outcomes in being able to uh, reduce sadness, reduce anxiety, keep people calm. It's small groups. We're working with about four nonprofits right now, but we are 
building relationships with other nonprofits. We did have a little glitch this past month because our music therapist that started this program and is in charge of it, unfortunately, did not win in the H1B1 lottery, and she's going back to Finland. However, our former manager, mm -hmm. Maureen Burkhardt, who many of you know, is now a consultant with us and sees patients and groups independently. She'll be working with us, and we're actively recruiting for another board-certified music therapist, and our manager, Lauren Meeks, will also be stepping in. So thank you so much for that funding because that program has been really important to a lot of people and we're looking forward to presenting more outcomes on that. And then finally, we wanted to talk a little bit about the mobile clinic. Um, just some observations, Liz, please join me. Um, <laughs> just some observations um, about the mobile clinic, um, just the uh, arena of mobile health in, in today's environment. Um, the United States is covering about 91% of the mobile clinic programs in the, in the globally. Uh, that market is expected to expand from $2.7 billion, which it was in two, 2022, to $8.2 billion in 2032. Um, so we're really excited that there's more mobile clinics in um, Indian River County, um, Whole Family Health. Uh, Treasure Coast Community Health, uh, the Mobile Clinic Act of October uh, 2022 actually allowed for federally qualified health centers to use money uh, to uh, operate mobile clinics. And so we're really excited that there's more mobile clinics coming into the arena, private ones as well as ones that are dealing with people that are medically, traditionally medically underserved, which is where we put our efforts. So <laughs> we are continuing to identify needs. We've been out west as well. Vicki, we're really excited your news today. Uh, we've been out west as well, identifying communities uh, where there are large populations of people in the west that are have traditionally been underserved. And so we've been going into a lot of subsidized housing communities, a lot of communities that are manufactured home, um, you know, I'm not exactly sure what to call all of them collectively, uh, but there's a lot of places where people just are not reached. And so we've been looking at that. That's something new, I think, for our program. Um, our challenge is really to keep up with the same staff that we've had for the last number of years, uh, but they're doing it. And um, Liz, I'll just let you give a couple of examples. Well, thank you again for the continued support for the mobile clinic. Um, I just wanted to briefly let you know that these past six months, we've increased our patient um, load or census by 100% compared to last year, these six months. So it continues to just grow. Um, we're, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, we're all just really excited to be out there every day. We continue to bridge, bridge the gap between the primary care and even those who do have primary care, because you probably know the statistics in Indian River County, there's only like one primary care per 1,600 people in this county. So it's very difficult to get in even when you do have one and you've got a strep throat or the flu or even COVID. So we're filling that gap. And we are filling in for the medications. And even uh, listening to Vicki early, I'm sorry, I'm going to take up too much time, but we are seeing those people coming out of prison who only have that 30-day prescription, and we're helping them with that. We're helping them till they get to that apartment, that appointment with McCabe or whoever they're being sent to. So we're filling in prescriptions for people that are in between or having to change physicians because they have a new uh, Medicare Advantage plan, and they have no physician, and they have diabetes. And, hypertension, so we're filling those in and keeping everybody from going to the emergency room, hopefully. And we continue to provide re, you know, referrals out to TCCH, Whole Family Health, McCabe, um, every, any place that we can you know, connect them with. We've done over 500 patients in the past six months. Uh, recently, our pa patient population is like 75% adults, but we'll see that shift a little bit through the summer months with school and everything coming up. And as Pat said, we are doing sites all across the county. We're out in Felsmere, we're up in Sebastian. We've started going to subsidize 65 and over, and we are expanding with Jackie, with our other um, departments in the VNA, trying to you know help these people that are falling through the cracks. Uh, it's, it's been amazing. We've really expanded these past couple of years, and I'm really thrilled, and I really appreciate your support on it. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. And just one other quick thing we wanted to mention is that our mobile clinic has, or our mobile program has traditionally been about the bus, but mobile health is really a program. And we have a whole other side to our community health services, which um, is now combined with the mobile clinic. And we are doing um, health education workshops and screenings. So our mobile clinic team will bring the bus someplace, and we will actually 
bring people onto the bus, but we don't just wait for them to come to the bus. We also go into their community centers and we do health education workshops for them. We find out in advance what is it that they're interested in learning about. We do screenings for people that want that. So it's really coming together as mobile health programs and bringing this education information, the, the ability to diagnose and treat to people where they are. So that's our report. I'm sorry we went over, Karen. Please don't hold it against us. We had a lot to talk about. Um, but I wholeheartedly, want to, on behalf of the VNA, want to thank each and every one of you. Um, Mary Beth, you know, your leadership in this has really helped to guide us a lot over these last few years. And just happy to really work with all of you and just so grateful for the support that you've given us. And thank you so much. VNA continues to have a very, very important place in this community. And, and I think it will going into the future, even with AI or without it. But because um, <laughs> you, you have the heart, as Paul said. So I, it's, you're an important part of our community. I was happy to see you got a new seat for the bus. Um, yeah, our driver is very happy. Seriously, where is Orange Blossom Community? North, west? I, I, it's, I don't know what that is. Okay, so we're, we're up in Sebastian at it's Walmart. An, so we're up there, and then we're okay. out west at the Little League Field in Felsmere, okay. and we're at St. Vincent de Paul, and we're over at this I Walmart. saw the list. That's You've referenced it. I just didn't yeah. know where that was Orange, at. Orange Blossom for U.S. It's the yes. Resource Association. Okay. Yeah, oh, that's Gardenia Gardens. Gardenia, 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 Gardenia Gardens, Gardenia and then Orange, Orange Blossom. Blossom. US one yes, today. right, right up yeah, by the track. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. It's the sister property to Gardenia Gardens, and they requested us to go there also. It's we towards um, the Vero Beach Country Club. It's yes. Down on that right street there. Right there. All right. Yeah. Thank you. And we just yeah, started going to senior resource. <laughs> go ahead, Bill. I have a question related to personnel, for example. You're doing dental work on the uh, mobile unit as well as no, you're not. We refer all of our dental okay. Across and same thing with vision testing. The Yes, we can oh, do check. vision screening, and then we do um, send them to Vicki, but her vision is new. We also use Globe Check. Okay. We also send them to Kaylee. The last time you presented, it almost sounded like you needed an, another bus. Is the yes. now work from uh, uh, Treasure Coast and Whole Family Health and others, are they supplanting that need? So you've really got three potential well, the, sources? Our yes. Okay. They're, they're in mobile. Their mobiles are in mobile. In our, in our well rolling said. four quarters, uh, for the first time, we saw over 5,000 patients. So, you know, we continue to track it and mm -hmm. we continue to uh, to monitor it. And But, you know, we've been... Well, that's what's impressive, the number of people you're seeing. Yes. Yeah. It's a long day, but it's very rewarding. <laughs> Again, thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. We appreciate it. Greatly appreciate it. And last but not least, we have Whole Family Health with Marie. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. So nice to be here. As always, we are so very grateful for the support of the hospital district, each and every one of you. Thank you so much. As you know, Whole Family Health Center is a community health center, nonprofit, or designated as an FQHC lookalike. And as a lookalike, we do not receive regular federal grant funding. So um, the funding that we've received from you is so incredibly impactful. So thank you so much. It really makes a difference to us and all the patients that we serve in the community. So I know you've seen the report and I um, much kind of like um, Vicki mentioned, uh, we're a little bit under budget in terms of our usage of the funding and our visits are down a little bit. But I think that's mostly because of the um, public health emergency. There was expanded Medicaid, and now that Medicaid has ended, of course. And so I think that we're going to see more uninsured patients than we had seen be so, uh, before. Now, one of the things that um, has occurred with, with us specifically is our, um, by design, our pharmacy has increased uh, substantially. And when I say that, um, it's, it's actually about 36% last year. And we're specifically trying to capture more of the patients. And Vicki alluded to this as well, because um, we contract with uh, Walgreens and CVS and Publix as well. So it's convenient for our patients to go into the community and receive um, the same 340B discounted pricing. But 
the manufacturers have really uh, put the kibosh on that in the past like three years. And so it, it's, be, it's becoming really difficult for our patients to get discounts unless they come to us specifically. So we have really put a lot of effort into that. We have more pharmacists. We actually have a clinical pharmacist too who's doing um, comprehensive medication review because when you have um, HIV patients as we do, I'm sure you remember our origins, we started as an HIV AIDS clinic, so we still have hundreds of patients, I mean primary care patients, but hundreds of HIV patients, and we serve them. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of chronic conditions, and they take a lot of medications. And so we can get those medications to them at a very good price. At the same time, when they're insured, we can make a positive margin on those medications. And of course, that positive margin must go back into our mission. That's the premise of the 340B program. And our mission is to serve everyone. So of course, there are people that we're serving who are uninsured that, um, that are, are served by the hospital district and the funding that you give us, but that's not 100%. You know, that, that makes up about 60% of our cost per visit. <clears throat> the rest of it is pretty much made up uh, from our pharmacy. So, um, so that's uh, been the challenge with the pharmacy program. And then, of course, the tremendous growth. Uh, and, and Vicki alluded to this, and, and so did Pat and Lundy in, in the VNA. Um, so we have been trying to expand its space and providers that are the most challenging things. And uh, we have recruited providers. It's very difficult. Uh, it's very expensive. That continues to be the case. Of course, we have to pay market. Um, it, they, you know, people don't come and say, oh, well, yeah, you're, not, you're a nonprofit organization, so we'll accept less. It just doesn't work that way. And of course, we want the best providers board certified that are out there. And uh, that, that takes a lot of time and effort. So in terms of growth for last year, we had about 15% growth last year in the number of patients that we saw. Now, you know, in comparison to TCCH, of course, you know, Vicki's talking about around 5%, but our numbers are vastly different. So whereas they saw, uh, you know, uh, they had 100,000 visits, we saw we had uh, probably just under 50,000 visits. Um, but, you know, the, the patients that come to us want to have the, the same good services no matter where they go, and they deserve that from, from us, from Treasure Coast, uh, VNA when they go out for the mobile unit. And speaking of mobile unit, um, we're really excited that we received an Impact 100 grant supplemented by the Johns Island Foundation that is um, that we were awarded just uh, in the past couple of months that we're going to purchase a mobile medical office and go out into the community. And, uh, and we actually met um, Pat and I and Vicki along with um, Anne Marie, she hosted us, thank you very much, to talk about you know, how we can serve the community and not duplicate our efforts, obviously. Um, that's what we're here to do, is to serve anyone and to, to all uh, work together. So um, I probably didn't go in order, but uh, I, I did want to mention, going back to um, our budget, because of the pharmacy situation, um, we have uh, asked for like a reallocation of our budget, so we're not going to use as many visits. And um, so we're asking to, to, it's just a change in a line item in the budget. So it's not asking for more. In fact, what we budgeted for the full year, which of course we're only talking about six months right now, is 820,000. We're projecting that we're gonna use 640,000 but um, our prescription uh, number has is, is gone up from 45,000 to a projection of 135,000 for this year. And then for the next fiscal year, we're asking for 160,000. And, and we did put that into our application. So I did send a little note to, um, I think, um, Jenny or Anne Marie about like this, why this change in the, in the pharmacy. Um, if you have any questions about that, you know, I can explain it further but it really is a very, very important component to our program for our patients and um, for all of our services because it does help to fund, you know, many, many other services in the community. Um, you know, patient care challenges is just being able to serve everyone. So many people are moving to Florida. I just read um, 
a few weeks ago that between 20 and uh, 2020 and 2022, a million people moved to Florida. A million people. I think half of them moved to the Treasure Coast. I mean, there are so many people that have come into this community that I've seen in the past couple of years, you know, and uh, I've been here. Oh, next month is my five year anniversary with Whole Family Health Center. So, yeah, I'm celebrating. Um, so anyway, uh, that that's that's really difficult and it does really take all of us to help the the patients in in the community um, financial challenges are of course we're, we're not getting more from medicaid and medicare the implemental um or incremental increases are are, are really uh relatively small but wages have gone up uh, tremendously because of inflation and that's across the board not just uh providers but you know, medical receptionists, medical assistants, all clinical support staff. But we are doing some really good things. We are continuing to expand here in, in Vero Beach. We have a new location that's just uh, opening near the hospital. It's about 3,000 square feet with um, seven exam rooms. So we're, we're putting three providers in there. So that's part of the expansion. It's all adults. And uh, we are also expanding um, our uh, uh, behavioral health, we're, we're trying to recruit a psychiatrist. We add uh, a therapist earlier this year. So um, it's difficult to recruit psych uh, anyone in behavioral health. I'm sure you've heard that from the other agencies. It's really difficult. We're, we're adding another pediatrician. Um, we're looking for an internal medicine physician, actually. Uh, we are, and, and it's not in this county, but it will help us tremendously. So in conjunction with Lawnwood Hospital, which is part of HCA in Fort Pierce, I think everybody knows that we have a facility in Fort Pierce. Not that you all fund, but, um, but we do run that, that facility. And so in conjunction with Lawnwood Hospital, um, we're hosting internal medicine residents. So these are physicians that are gonna go through their first year, second year, and third year residents. And um, they've asked us to participate. We have internal medicine physician that's going to be hosting them, along with Dr. Perrone, who was obviously an internal medicine physician mm -hmm. and uh, infectious disease specialty as well. So we're really excited about that because you know we think it's a good thing for the community. And then we're hoping that in a few years that some of those physicians will decide to remain with us because it's very, very difficult to recruit physicians family practice, internal medicine, psychiatrists, you know, um, nurse practitioners are, are probably a little bit easier, but you do need some physicians as well. So we're really excited about that. And um, let's see, with all the other things that are going on, uh, HERS is coming in to do a, virtu uh, a virtual operational site visit. So we've been preparing for that. It all culminates on July 5th. And um, it's kind of like a, second full-time job for all of us. So we'll be happy when that's over. Mm -hmm. I think I covered everything. Is there, what about PAs? Everybody's talking RNs and, and LPNs and that, but um, are you seeing a growth in PAs as well? I, I've seen a few that have, uh, from recruiters that that been sent over to us and we, we absolutely will consider them as well. But we do feel that we, we need some, some physicians. Like even in the new yeah. practice, we have one physician and uh, two nurse practitioners. So the physician that's in the, in the practice has been uh, practicing for like 20 years. So we really want to be sure that there's someone really strong in that practice. Not that the nurse practitioners aren't. One um, probably has a couple of years of experience. The other one maybe has about five years. So it's a good mix. Just uh, my, our experience lately has been that you generally go in and see the PA, mm -hmm. and then if you really have something, then maybe you get to see the physician. So, um, well, really hoping. I mean, with this uh, residency program, I mean, it's going to take a while. That sounds good. Obviously, you know, perhaps some of them will will remain with us, not just in the practice in Fort Pierce, but here in Bureau Beach as well. So we're very excited about that. And we continue to expand in Fort Pierce. You know, we own that entire campus. It, US-1 and Seaway right. Drive, and, and we do see some uh, patients from uh, South Indian River County go to that practice as well. It's only about 10 right. miles away, so. I have a question that is spawned by <laughs> what you said, and maybe I should know this. Um, 
and I'm not necessarily just with behavioral health, mental health, but with docs. Do the providers, do the agencies talk, meaning if you, th if you split the cost and can pay an extra 15% out of yours and Vicki can throw an extra 15% out of hers, maybe that's enough to get somebody here. I don't know if those are the kind of conversations that routinely happen or everybody's just, it, it's fighting for who you can get. Um, I, I don't know what's feasible. Mental Health Collaborative, Anne Marie worked on anything like that in terms of, of um, mental health providers in the community? We haven't yet. I think Wes has been talking about trying to move forward an initiative for some training, recruitment, retention, for that kind of thing, education, CMEs, those kinds of we things. We do but, refer, you know, so but, we'll well, Obviously. Yeah. It's just in terms of actually getting um, the doc here. Uh, right. It's a money thing is, yeah. is what it is. about the, the challenge mm -hmm. and the solutions. Right. Yeah. It's expensive, yeah. I mean, there's there's no doubt. It's, it's very expensive, so. Um, just an observation for you and Vicki, I know that both of you now have medical students or res in training. Um, yes. There should be increased compensation from um, Medicare Medicaid when you have a teaching program. So you can look into that if there is teaching provided by the physicians to the residents and, and the compensation for those activities is great or greatly funded by the, by the federal government. Okay. Uh, so, so I know that you know, in conjunction with um, Longwood, they we we do receive some compensation for the time that our own physicians are spending with uh, the residents, okay. right. um, and uh, you know, obviously there's didactics that take up their time, and then ultimately the residents cannot see patients alone in their first year, but then as they go on, they can see patients. So that would be an expansion right there. So we really see the program as a win-win. I, I don't know that in the beginning it's gonna produce a lot more revenue, but you know, every, every strategy um, doesn't have to be short-term, it, it's long-term as well. Any other questions for Marie? Thank you, Marie, appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you so much, appreciate it. It's kind of a nice picture to see the VNA, Treasure Coast, and the whole family all together, right? I mean, it's a it's a good picture. I did that purposely. <laughs> Eat them all. Yeah, that was Jenny. She did that. Um, any unfinished business from trustees? I don't know if this is unfinished business, and I haven't listened to the recording from yesterday. Was there any update on the executive director search yesterday? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'll listen to the tape. You don't need yes. to record. Don't need to repeat it. Thank okay. you. Yes. <laughs> okay, um, new business, I think one of the things that we need to do is to uh, gain approval of hiring BJM, right? Mm -hmm. Said that right, I said that correct, as the uh, person who's gonna do the group that is gonna do the uh, assessment of us. So if I could get a motion to... So moved. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 And then, okay, thank you. We needed to do that, okay? Okay, so um, I just, I will add, uh, because I didn't mention it before, it is in the, the cost is um, in, in the right. Right. materials that I gave to you, but is a, is a median kind of, of where we came out on the four proposals. Yeah, so the that I think is important, plus the product that is gonna be delivered, so. Thank you guys for well, being thank here. You. Yeah, I like your experience. And I'll be in touch. Yes. <laughs> Huge. Okay, we do have uh, two resolutions that need to be done, and the first one, Michael, is yours. <clears throat> uh, establishment of Finance and Audit Committee. Whereas the Indian River County Hospital District, the district, is a special taxing district created by the legislature at the state of, of the state of Florida, Chapter 2003382, Laws of Florida and located in Indian River County, Florida. Whereas the district's board of trustees, the trustees, a body public and corporate is the governing body of the district. Whereas the board shall 
cause true and accurate minutes to be kept of all business transacted by them, which minutes, records, and books of account shall at all reasonable times be open and subject to the inspection of the residents of the hospital district, subject to any restrictions provided by law, whereas the district is charged with investing and managing financial resources to best serve the health care needs of Indian River County residents, whereas during the district's regular meetings held on February 15th, 2023, and April 20th, 2023, the trustees considered the establishment of a finance and audit committee to oversee the management of the district's financial resources, whereas the residents of Indian River County would benefit from the oversight provided by a finance and audit committee. Now, therefore, be it resolved one, the trustees hereby establish a finance and audit committee as a standing committee of the Indian River County Hospital District. Two, the finance and audit committee shall act as an oversight and advisory panel to the board of trustees on the financial operations of the district and shall consist of the district treasurer, the district executive director, one local certified public accountant who is not the district auditor, one local banker, broker, financial analyst, or other financial professional, and a minimum of one but a maximum of three local representatives with background and experience appropriate to provide financial oversight. Three, the trustees shall establish and maintain guidelines describing the function, members, meetings, and responsibilities of the Finance and Audit Committee. Four, the resolution shall take effect immediately upon its adoption dated this 15th day of June, 2023. May I hear a motion to pass the resolution? So oh, moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Again? No. Okay, the resolution is passed. Thank you. Um, the second resolution that we have tonight relates to the sale of the hospice house parcel. Um, whereas, the Indian River County Hospital District, the district, is a special taxing di district created by the legislature of the state of Florida, Chapter 2003382, Laws of Florida, and located in Indian River County, Florida. Whereas the district's board of trustees, the trustees, a, public, a body public and corporate, is the governing body of the district, whereas the board shall cause true and accurate minutes to be kept of all business transacted by them, which minutes, records, and books of account shall at all reasonable times be open and subject to the inspection of the residents of the hospital district, subject to any restrictions provided by law. Whereas the district is the owner of real property, formerly described as the hospice house parcel, situated in Indian River County with the legal description of the northeast quarter of the northwest quarter of section 36, township 32 south, range 39 east, less and except the west 520 feet thereof, less and except the east 275 feet of the south 800 feet thereof, less and except the south 310 feet thereof, and less and except the north 75 feet thereof. Whereas the district entered into a lease agreement with the Visiting Nurse Association of the Treasure Coast, Inc. on December 19, 1996 for the lease of the hospice house parcel as amended and restated on November 24, 2020 and amended again on April 14, 2021, cor correcting the name of the leasee to the lease to the Visiting Nurse Association and Hospice Foundation, Inc. due to a Scrivener's error. Whereas said lease agreement as corrected contained a provision which granted the Visiting Nurse Association and Hospice Foundation, Inc. an option to purchase the hospice house parcel during the lease term. Whereas the Visiting Nurse Association and Hospice Foundation, Inc. provided notice to the district of its intent to exercise the option to purchase the hospice house parcel on May 9, 2023. Whereas in order for the district to sell the hospice house parcel, the trustees must determine by resolution that the hospice house parcel is no longer useful in connection with the, such health facilities and health and medical services provided by the district and its surplus property. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the trustees determine that the real proper, property formerly described above as the hospice, hospice house parcel is no longer useful to the district in connection with such health facilities and health and medical services provided therein and is deemed to be surplus property. 
the trustees accept the May 9th, 2023 option to purchase and agree to move forward with the process to sell the Hospice House parcel to the Visiting Nurse Association and Hospice Foundation, Inc. for fair market value as determined by an agreed upon appraisal subject to a purchase and sale agreement to be entered into by the parties with the legal description of the Northeast Quarter of the Northwest Quarter of Section 36, Township 32 South, Range 39 East, less and except the west 520 feet thereof, less and except the east 275 feet of the south 800 feet thereof, less and except the south 310 feet thereof, and less and except the north 75 feet thereof. Three, this resolution shall take effect immediately upon its adoption. Dated this 15th day of June 2023, the party shall enter into a purchase and sale agreement and begin to work towards closing on the subject real property. May I hear a motion? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you very much. Any other business? Mary Beth, just um, I appreciate your uh, engagement with uh, Cleveland Clinic's leadership and their their plans to come to our chairman's meeting next uh, next month. Yes. I submitted some questions and in, in conjunction with those questions, requests for document just so that we could be better informed as they address those questions. Are they intending to answer the questions that were submitted or what's what's gonna happen at that meeting? And I, I would like to be prepared in terms of um, having the questions addressed and having the documentation. And if, they're in, if their intent is not to provide in the document any of the documentation, I'm happy to do send a letter asking and, and saying, hey, I'd, I'd like it a week in advance. Please put, let me know in writing. Um, if you don't intend to provide the, the information, but I just, so that we don't show up next month and not have the opportunity to be fully prepared and, and have a circumstance where we'll have to come back later next month or the month after. So have you, have you had a chance to discuss with them how they're intending to handle that meeting? And um, the, I believe the intent was to address the questions, but in a verbal situation, not in the documentation. Okay. Um, we can go back and request them to do that. Um, we have. I'm happy. You know what? I'm happy to direct a letter. Uh, I'll I'll just send a personal letter if that's okay. And and or if you if you want, I just the, the I don't want to be here and get a verbal report without supporting information that may be relevant to that. And so, and the letter. Uh, um, Is a uh, personal letter appropriate? Well, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm asking more than so, I'm saying. I was, if, 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 so. if not, if I need to work through you or if we need to. Um, uh, I, I have I, not seen the, the questions that you submitted. Right. And so um, why don't I work with Anne Marie and we will go back with them and sure. talk about that and ask them for whatever documents. And if it requires a second occasion to get together because the, you know, that, that'll be fine. Um, I'd prefer not to, to have to go through that. but. Yeah, let me work with Anne Marie and, and I just didn't want to not say anything and and yep. have them show up and uh, without having nobody wants to be blindsided. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. So we'll do that. One one thing I want to backtrack just since we've approved, we have a finance and audit committee now. Obviously, a couple of names that have hopefully been talked about were Alan Jones and uh, Keith Morgan. Um, I would ask any of the trustees that have other uh, ideas of uh, good membership there to forward them to Anne Marie so that technically we can bring them back and we'll talk and come up with something so there'll be a proposal. I, I mean, those two I think are exceptional, um, but we have room for them. So put your thinking caps on, uh, someone that fits the criteria, um, get it to Anne Marie. Good, okay. Any public comment? You're not even going to say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are we are adjourned. Thank you, Barbara.